So here in the state of Pennsylvania, winter is settling in. The temperatures are dropping. These are male drone honeybees that have been tossed out on the landing board to die, while the females are warm and toasty inside consuming honey. Now we have small mammals out where I live here, and they like to head inside too. They can't get into these beehives, but some of them, unfortunately, do get into my house. And I'm gonna show you two different species of mice and the best possible way there is to get rid of them. So here we are in my basement. What we're looking at right there to the right, skittering along, is a house mouse. I'm gonna show it to you up close, but house mice are pretty fast moving. In fact, they can run up to eight miles an hour. So these things are found all over the place. Super agile, omnivorous, they can eat everything, which means that they're survivors. They show up everywhere, they might chew your wiring, they could chew through the studs in your house over time, of course. So we don't want to leave them undealt with. That's why I have little traps set up there. These little made-to-catch traps, those designs. Nothing goes in there and gets out, but this little house mouse is too clever to get in and be stuck. So what about it? These things are like six to eight inches long. That includes the tail, of course, but they're tiny. They can go a lot of places. Here's one running along the top of a copper tube here for the water supply of the house. But because those copper tubes run up against the floor joists, it really can't use that as the main corridor. So I've blocked its travels through the top of the cinder block walls with those cages. Now, if they weren't blocked, look at this, right down into the masonry there. So that means the mice are out of reach for me once they go down in there. And we got to find a way to deal with them. There are two kinds of mice that we run into here, so I'm gonna show you both. So this is, of course, the house mouse, gray on the back, gray on the stomach. I'm going to, of course, catch it and show you the details up close to show you what they're like. They have really good hearing, okay sense of smell, okay vision, and uh, they just cover a lot of ground. So once they come into your house, of course, summertime, they move out, they go out, they hunt bugs and everything else. There's some benefits, no benefit to having one of these inside your house. Now, what else can I think of to tell you about them? Here he is again, avoiding my traps. You might hear him in the middle of the night. And of course, one of the reasons I put cameras on these things, I want to see where it's going, what it's doing. Well, I know they get down in between the masonry there. If you know about cinder blocks or concrete blocks, you know that they are hollow. There's two chambers that run down the full height of that basement wall. And then look, it's going to go over the back there. And it has another place that it's hiding. So here it is. That's right. I caught it. One of the traps. So we can give you a close look at it. Look at the size of the eyes. If you want to know what senses a small mammal uses the most, look at the physiology of the animal. Little twitchy nose, little tiny pointed heads. So they can get in small spaces. They have whiskers so they can feel if the opening is big enough for their whole body to get through. The bigger the ears, the more they rely on their hearing. The bigger the eyes, the more they rely on sight. This one has medium sized eyes, but I want you to see the coat it is brown to gray and of course we're in winter time now this is november and they have a nice thick coat on so that they can of course be protected their tail is pretty scaly and is not completely covered in hair that's probably what gives a lot of people the creeps and i wanted you to see how agile they are plus the fact that wherever they go they just poop that's why you find mouse droppings, and that is the best way to find out if you've got mice in your shed, in your shop, in your basement, in your pantry, heaven forbid, but you'll find little pellets of waste there behind. Let's look at this in slow motion so you can get a feeling for this tiny mammal and how agile it really is. It's just jumping straight up from sheets of white paper, glass sides, and it could jump to a height of 20 inches pretty easily so if there was an edge for it to get a hold of up there it would be doing it and it would be out so if you're thinking about trapping them in some kind of trash can or something like that you set up these little flip traps and stuff 20 inches minimum i'd go 25 or 26 just to be sure 
And if you put something like pine shavings down at the bottom, it takes away some of their jump power because the softer substrate gives as they push off with their hind feet to take off. But they're fast moving. They're survivors. That's why they're still here. Now this is a non-native species of mammal, by the way, brought to the uh, United States, brought to North America by settlers, of course. Now here for comparison is the deer mouse. The deer mouse, uh, this is a woodland deer mouse, actually they're called, and its white underside is very distinctive, very closely related to the white-footed mouse that sometimes people confuse it for. It's called the deer mouse because it has fur on the back that resembles the color of the white-tailed deer that we have up here. But I want you to notice, too, how good do you think its vision is? Well, it has huge eyes, big ears, good for hearing. Of course, it's eating black oil sunflower seeds there, which is why you might see it in your bird feeders from time to time. They can run right up the front of a beehive, by the way, and they can't get in through the beehive if the opening is three-eighths of an inch, and that's true also for that little house mouse there because the limiting factor for what they can get through is that aerodynamic little fuzzy skull they have there. This one's, of course, grooming and cleaning its feet and everything else. These are younger, so sometimes you might find a deer mouse that is actually gray in color with a white underbelly, and that's because it's a juvenile. So they transition as they mature into this deer-colored furry backside, and of course the white underbelly, the cream-colored underbelly, remains the same. And they're extremely agile, but they don't run as fast as the house mouse. These things are clocking in at about five miles per hour. Easy to trap, by the way. They walk right into my live catch traps and make it easy for me to make videos like this of them drinking water like this one's doing here. You don't want to keep them as pets, though. You want to get rid of them. If there's a wildlife recovery center, like raptors and things like that, they always need wild mice. So if you can box them up and make a call to a recovery center, they'll be more than happy to have these. Now here's how I'm taking care of them. This is the most interesting part of this video right here. That is not a mouse. That fast moving little mammal right there is a short tailed shrew. The North American short tailed shrew is large. Look how it moves, how jerky it is. Look at the long sleek face it has. Look at the short tail. Look at that dense glistening coat. This thing moves like lightning. And what's it hunting? Why did it come into the house? Well, it's hunting mice. So that thing is better than any mouse trap you could put up. Because look, it's gonna go into every little nook and cranny. It doesn't have a great sense of smell, which is really fascinating. Look at it go right down there. I hope it finds those mice and munches them all up. Now there are some nightmare aspects to this little mammal. I'm gonna explain that as we go too, but I'm glad to have them in the basement. I want you to get a good look at them, but one of the things that they do to navigate is echolocation, or echolocation, if you want to say that, like bats do. They emit ultrasonic clicks and noises. So I slowed this way down, and I cranked up the volume, hoping to catch some of those ultrasonic sounds, which we know is at 20,000 cycles per second or higher. Unfortunately, the audio on this camera just isn't good enough and may not even be set up to record frequencies higher than 20,000 cycles per second. But we also get a chance to slow down the mammal and see how it moves. I was hoping it was going to try to use its little chirps and squeaks. Sometimes you hear them fighting out in meadows underneath overgrowth. They make a lot of chirps, noises that we can hear that are under 20,000 cycles per second. But when they're fighting with one another, they chirp and make a lot of noise because these things are highly territorial. I think he made a couple of squeaks before he went down that hole, but the good news is there's no mouse that's going to outrun this guy. And you might be wondering, maybe you could catch him and we'd get a better look at him. Oh, look, he walked right into my live catch trap. Now, he's in jeopardy, by the way. They have a high metabolic rate. They really need, that was a slowed down repeat of the trap going off. They really need to feed. 
and their survival rate in wintertime is extremely low. These things, 90% of them die during winter. That's right, 10% of them make it through winter, and that's because they have to hunt, they have to feed. Now, there's something very interesting. Remember I said it's a nightmare sort of mammal, and that's because, see those long teeth? See them trying to bite the sides of the interior of that aquarium? Very long teeth, and they have venom. That's right, this is a venomous mammal. Gets worse. When they get a hold of a mouse and they bite it, and the venom, by the way, comes out with their salivary glands. So their saliva carries the venom. They have to chew the animal that they're biting onto. See that liquid that's coming out just under his nose right there? Saliva. So when it bites, just like a Gila monster, the Mexican beaded lizard, for example, they bite and chew to push the venom into the skin of the prey, or if they're being defensive, which this little guy right now is probably feeling defensive, they want to get that venom into you. Would it kill a person? Unlikely. But that doesn't mean it's going to feel good. It's going to hurt. But what does it do to mice? What it does to a mouse is, once they bite the mouse and get that venom in there, they drag it back in a paralyzed state into their little den, which is probably about 8 inches in diameter. And they leave it there, and they feed on it. And that venom, look at its nose right now. See the drip? That's not necessarily the venom itself, but it is the saliva. And this little guy is ready to bite you. Also, I want you to notice the ears. Their hearing is not awesome, but it is their number one sense. So the ears are basically covered. Now, the other thing is, if you've ever had a dog with a thick coat of fur, they shed in spring. Well, so do shrews. So this shrew, this time of year, has the thickest, most dense coat. And that's so it can survive. What's its defense when big animals come after it? Fox feed on them. Things like owls would hunt them at night. So their practice is to run and hide and stay put. And that's when they die. They can't cruise around and get the food and resources that they need. There are a wide range of things that they can eat. But this whole idea of them putting venom into mice and dragging the mice back to their den is really interesting. Now what I want to show here too is, I'm catching them with this glass right now and I'm going to take something that is like a uh, postcard and we're going to slide it underneath. We're going to pick them up because I want to see how high a shrew can jump. I can tell you ahead of time. They're not great jumpers. What they are is really fast movers. They can burrow really fast. So if they're chasing a vole or a mole or a mouse they can follow it right into the dirt. If the holes aren't big enough, they'll dig their own way to them, and they'll ambush them. So, the short-tailed shrew is a fantastic predator of mice. Look at those tiny eyes, basically worthless. The idea of echolocation as they find their way around in the dark is amazing to me. Now we're going to flip them over. There he is. Not happy to be in that glass, but this is a standard glass that you would drink iced tea out of. Maybe it's eight inches tall, and it was unsuccessful in jumping straight up out of it. So they're not jumpers. What they are is fast moving on the ground, and as you saw earlier, fast moving on the walls of my basement foundation. So I'm concerned about him. He's uh, stressed, obviously needs to get outside, needs to get back to hunting. So I'm going to release him. It is 4.30 in the morning, somewhere around that time, so I don't want to wait until daybreak to get them out there. 36 degrees Fahrenheit outside. This was filmed on November 13th, 4.41 a.m. So I need to get them out there. I know it's going to make a video of him running away, but he took off so fast, the night cam didn't even pick it up. He ran right into the undergrowth and took off there. So you're probably worried about him. What happened? Was he stressed? Did he die? Nope. Within a matter of 48 hours, he was right back in the basement on camera hunting mice. So you don't want to kill them. These things will hunt mice for you and go everywhere the house mouse could possibly go, as well as deer mice. There he is. Had to slow things way down because he's like furry lightning flying through there. And he even bumps these cages out of the way so that they're not blocking him from running along the top of the cinder blocks. That was slowed way down, just so you could get a look at them. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something today about a mammal that a lot of people don't get the chance to see. The short-tailed shrew.
Thanks for watching.